on, my friends, and this is Rick, and you're seated at the table, and we're talking things all, all things Battletech, and I want to discuss the various types of forces potentially found in the Battletech universe, the Battletech universe. We're all familiar with the, 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 the roundhouse numbers of how many line regiments that the average the average houses have. Some have 80, some have 70, etc., etc. Uh, they have reserve, they have planetary garrisons, uh, the clans have their mainline forces, they have their provincial forces, and then they have uh, they have Sol Soloma units. So the idea is, is that there are far more opportunities for your gaming experience in the Battletech universe than just house on house combat or mercenary on uh, house combat, etc. That That's perhaps sometimes overlooked, but if you look at the stories and the lore, the truth is that there are the, the forces for the battle, uh, the Iron Sphere and beyond are much, much greater than what appears at first. So when we think about, you know, additional traditional combat, we're looking at your standard battle mech lances and companies, battalions, regiments of, of house troops or mercenary employed troops engaging in combat against each other or against uh, bandits or something like uh, this of this nature. So when you do a overview, I've seen numbers that run the gamut from 10,000 to 20,000 battle mechs being uh, the total sum force available to the inner sphere in general, ton for ton, machine for machine. There's probably four or 500 mech regiments spread around the inner sphere amongst the great houses and mercenary commands, probably 10 times that in armor and infantry forces, perhaps even greater about the equivalent in aerospace. So there's probably four or 500 aerospace regiments the equivalent thereof floating around. But this is not the all the end to of all or beat all the end all of all the mechs available. And I want to talk about some of those. For example, we are all familiar with the line regiments and that are tradition for the uh, battle mech forces that we find in uh, the inner sphere. The I gotta walk my down way through these things a little bit. Uh, books full of them, source books full of them, lots of information on them. We also have what would be considered second line forces, secondary forces. These would be the clan's equivalent uh, of the provisional galaxies forces. These are your garrison troops, your defending forces that are usually tied to a specific region or territory or world, for example, uh, the terminology is fluid because in a lot of houses, in a lot of places, these would be considered reserve forces, i.e. The, the, the idea of the reserve military and or militia forces. And using the term militia in conjunction with modern day equivalents is difficult because it's not properly used in that aspect. Militia units uh, would be the, uh, not unlike having uh, in your, what might be considered uh, secondary defending forces. Once again, provisional forces. In, uh, in the Dracona, or in the uh, Federated Sons, uh, the, there's a quite a few militias, the, the DMM, the CMM militia, et cetera, et cetera. And these are generally second line line units they are still staffed by full-time AFFS military personnel and are in the command structure and in the, uh, the, the TOE of the house's uh, main military. It is not unheard of for elements of these various militia units to be shipped elsewhere, including outside their provinces, to augment forces or defense or attack purposes on other worlds in the region or in the neighboring regions. The same term militia, though, if you, you, if you look at the Free Worlds League, is not used in the same vernacular. The militia, the, the Merrick militia in House Merrick are all line units. These are all first defense, first offense, top of the line, best equipped, or in the running of regular house forces. And if you look at the rest of the houses, the inner sphere, 
major and minor and uh, the periphery. It, we're back to the militias often being reserve troops or, or provisional troops, regional troops, world troops, etc., etc. So the fact is that that we often see a, a quite a a blend or moving in of all these uh, different types. The third category that I have on my list are training caters. Pretty much every house of every inner inner sphere of power, be it Comstar, the clans, the various houses, the various minor houses, the periphery, have training facilities and programs to train pilots and, and infantry units and armor command uh, armor personnel, etc. So for like the, if you look at the Draconis Combine as the, the, the prime example. The Zheng Zhao training and cater are literal frontline troops that are not frontline troops. These are up and coming green recruits or officer candidates in training who are assigned to these academies. And then at a certain point in their training, they actually are put in the field into combat scenarios. They are often used to augment existing line forces and reserve forces when necessary. They act as defending forces on the particular world where they are stationed and or their training facilities are located. And they can be quite effective. To So to look at them from a, you know, a, a third rate category is kind of a mistake. We see some of this at other houses in various levels. The Not all houses conduct their training procedures in a similar way. Uh, we know that as prior to the fourth succession war, Hans Davion had been experiencing with militia training battalions. These were regional uh, uh, field training operations where they, they gave people who would not normally have access to the higher level academies and or the means to get into them opportunities to serve the house by joining these these train these training battalions. Uh, Justin Allard uh, uh, was the, uh, the major of, a, of such a battalion at, at the beginning of the Warrior Respite or the uh, su for succession where Gambus before they uh, began to uh, open up and try to remember what the name of the series I got the series here uh, the warrior trilogy series so every house has got training for training outfits of some sort and some of the best ways to get uh, to improve one's skills is to actually serve in the active ground or in the active possible uh, scenario of war. This brings us to my fourth tier or my fourth uh, variant of mech forces to be found, military forces uh, to be found in the inner sphere and beyond. And that is what I call the home guard or the planetary defenders. These would be third line troops in, in, in the, uh, the eyes and minds of many of the uh, command, command and control officers of the major houses. These generally never leave their, their particular home world. Perhaps they don't, they're actually assigned to a certain region or planet, uh, city or something in that specific, on that specific world. So they may never ever see action off world as augmenting other forces sort of stuff. Uh, this is also would be the equivalent of the, the inner spheres version of the national guard. These people are weekend warriors who generally do not, uh, are not in the field unless there's either in training mode or in an actual emergency where the war is being attacked uh, or invaded. A lot of these these home guard units, these planetary defender units, are going to have the least powerful mech units designed. They're going to be heavy with armor and infantry. And in many cases, that's all they have is armor and infantry. But they should not be dis, uh, completely uh, despised or discounted as being ineffective because they can be. They have a lot of uh, advantages that uh, are overlooked. And one being that many veteran uh, mech warriors and combat personnel who, quote, retire from the mainline units, retire to their home worlds or return to these worlds where they're going to spend out the rest of their days. And then they join these home guards. They join the, the, the planetary defender force or whatever 
they choose whatever they're being called given on the individual world and that's something that's that we have to take into account uh, that can vary from house to house and region to region just what these monikers are for these these horses they, they're quite varied so they're actually while they can be considered green and untested, in reality they might be veteran. They might be backed by a core of veterans who are very experienced. Uh, their equipment, once again, is third rate. This in part is because so much resources and material is required by the line units and the reserve or militia units and the training caters that are that are ahead of them that uh, they just they're just not priorities for the logistic chain. And so it would not be unheard of for a, 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 a home guard battle mech company to only be 50% functionable because of lack of parts or lack of, uh, you know, ex, you know equip, the, the technical expertise needed to fix the machinery. Uh, it's the same thing that might be found in their tanks and their vehicles, although the more lower tech those vehicle, those machines are, the, the greater the chances of them being easy to be maintained by local sources. The uh, other thing to consider is that uh, when we talk about third line forces, these are like the Saloma units for the clans. Uh, these are, they, they, in a lot of ways, they're looked down upon. And, and, and the clans, they despise the Saloma units, to be truthful. They're just, they're just chattel. They're, they're, they're warriors on their way down or troublemakers who do not deserve to have quality equipment and in, in many cases they have no equipment at all it's whatever they can scrounge up so but these people in some cases have turned out to be quite resilient quite savvy they know the world's well they know the secrets they know the back roads and the back pathways they they, they know where their supply they don't they pre-positioned supply catches or they know where some that were left behind from the last major war etc so you know, it, it's kind of disingenuous to continue or not to, to, to discount these folks because the opportunities for their value and use is still there uh, this brings us to my fifth category of mech forces and the combat forces that you may encounter or you may uh, become part of or you may utilize in your in your battle tech campaigns and that is the noble guards or defenders it's been my, uh, a topic for as long as battle tech has been in existence that we the the politics of battle tech of the inner sphere and beyond in general is what's called neo-feudalism or feudalism and that every house regardless of every planet regardless of what kind of local political structures in place you can have communism Taoism you can have you, you can have uh, democracy you can have uh, you, you can have an autocracy you can have every possible scenario all across the inner sphere and you do Free World League, once again, is chuck a block full of different governmental systems at the planetary and even at the city level. But in general, every one of these planets are ruled by an appointed noble. Rather, that, that noble position is hereditary, which is generally the case in most, most houses, or a one-off. They are appointed for the duration, they're appointed until they're not appointed or they're replaced, and some and there's some scenarios where this plays out. It's a, it's a title that's handed over to them uh, as, as a reward or as uh, a, a form of bribery or something to that effect. And in, ca in some cases, these, these, these titled positions are uh, at best just for show that the local governments once again pretty much run the show and do it every, and take care of all the issues and some uh, it's not uncommon for many of these houses these quote uh, uh, nobles these these barons and counts and to uh, not ever even be present on their world you know that they don't actually take an active hand in running things but there are quite a few that do. Probably the majority of them have at least some important input into how their particular fight is running. So when we talk about neo-feudalism, that's basically how the inner sphere operates. And most of the outer periphery nations follow the same uh, floor plan. So uh, it's like Bannerman. 
Federated, or, or, or uh, once again, Free World League is the grandest example of this. So all of these smaller entities owe an allegiance to the next layer of, of nobles above them, who then in turn swear allegiance to the House Lord, which whatever title that particular House Lord may may have, be it Coordinator, Chancellor, Archon, Prince, etc. So the Basics is the House Lords summons his bannermen, and that's what these Yahoos do. They start, they they mobilize their forces in in name and defense of the House, but on a smaller scale, when we look at the Dukes and Countesses and Baronesses and Barons and and so on of uh, the Inner Sphere and beyond, uh, each one of them, most most of them have some kind of personal bodyguard unit. And some of them can be quite elaborate, quite, quite in depth. And these combat units, depending on the wealth of the noble and the, uh, the noble and the minor house we're talking about here, because every noble uh, assigned or hereditary noble is basically representing a house. A house. So when we talk the great houses, that they're great because they're the house of their particular. Uh, government entity. So in, in the Federated Sons, the first prince is called the first prince for a reason. There are other princes. And generally, there's only, there's supposed to be three other princes. There's supposed to be the, the Crucius March, the Draconis March, and then the Periphery March, as well as uh, uh, the Capellan March. So we usually only hear about the Capellan March, the Hassock Davions, or the Robinsons from uh, uh, the Draconis March, and of course the, uh, the, the Davions, who are the Grand Prince family of the Crucius March. But within all those marches are hundreds of smaller worlds. They're all led by appointed or hereditary noble people, noblemen or noble women, who they themselves are heads of minor houses, because that's how feudalism systems work, and that's how our battle tech universe operates. So it's it, the bigger they are, the more wealth they have, the more resources available to them, the more likelier that they're going to field very well-equipped, well-motivated, well-trained, the personal guards. And they don't answer to the house, the greater house lords. They do not fit into the command and control systems or the line military units of the great houses because they're, they're beholden specifically to their liege lord and funded and supported by that lord. Now, that's not to say that these, these units don't occasionally enter battle. You know, the, 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 one of the grandest examples of this, of course, back to the Federated Sons, is uh, the Day Beyond Guards. The Day Beyond Guards are line units, but they're also they're, you know, part and partial of House Day Beyond. It's like the New Sectors Fuselers. Those are part and parcel extensions of the Prince of the Capellan March and his family, the, ha the Hassett Davions. Although, over time, the control, command and control has blurred to the point where the line house, the house line commanders get the opportunity to deploy these forces and utilize them as needed. But there's still always second and third units that sit home and protect the ducal, the Duke's, the Duke's home world, the Duke's palace, the Duke's personal interests, and do not are not required to act hand in hand with the house military. So this brings us, of course, to the the number six on my list. Which, uh, in in reality, if you if you go from uh, uh, oh the common the common factor mercenaries mercenaries kind of fall outside of the box in in this argument or this this example but at the same time they're they're found at all levels at all levels of all of what i'm talking about here it, it it's not unheard of for mercenary units to serve houses to serve corporate interests to serve private employers to serve uh, elements like comstar or religious orders or anybody with the pockets the deep enough pockets that can afford to engage and to uh, engage and to support them so mercenaries can be found all across the board in all categories uh, in any place in the inner sphere and beyond this this one of the things that makes playing a mercenary command is so interesting 
it's always been my experience is that the fact is that they don't they're not necessarily tied to any one creed or or standard or belief system uh one year they might be an employee of the uh, of a of a baron in uh house Corita, uh fighting bandits and pirates and being involved in local intrigue and things like this another year they might be employed by comstar to be exploring or to uh back up a a adventure going on in the periphery uh, that might lead to a year uh, you know a contract with periphery power uh Mercenary, you might find yourself down on its luck and become a periphery power, uh, i.e., Bandit Kingdom. The uh, mercenaries might then find themselves employed by a corporate magnet who's looking to defend uh, his corporate interests in addition to uh, the house defenders, or perhaps he, uh, he or she does not trust the house forces to defend his particular interests in specifically or he feels that his home world is being under defended so he wants to make sure that his industrial facilities are well guarded see the list just goes down the line on and on and on so which in then turn brings us to the next liar or tier of uh yeah that's not right that's what one uh the next tier and that would be uh i get it on here right there we go no that's morgan yeah, I got it right. Okay. Is corporate and security forces. Right off the bat, the most well-known corporate defense force that comes to mind is the Defiant Self-Protection Force. This is a regiment plus of assault and heavy mechs, extremely well-trained, extremely well-equipped, the most modern equipment that Hesperus Industries can produce, and its sole purpose is to defend Hesperus II and its mech factories from all comers, be them invading clans, raids raids from uh, from bandits or from other houses, other house militaries, uh, mercenary commands under whomever's, uh, you know, pay, and on occasion from their, from their own, their own home, uh, their own home, or uh, their own, uh, entities within uh, the uh, uh, commonwealth. It's not unheard of. It's happened before. The elements within uh, commonwealth have decided that they, you know, the free sky movement is notorious for this. And at least on two separate occasions, they have attempted to gain control of the Hesperus. Hesperus controls a large portion of the commonwealth's mech production and, and uh, military hardware and uh, mech parts production for uh, the Commonwealth, the loss of Hesperus would be crippling. You know, between Coventry Works and Hesperus, we're talking about putting most of your eggs in one basket. So the the, the corporate interests of, of Defiance Industries have decided it, it's in their best interest to have a dedicated, highly motivated, well-paid, highly equipped defense force of their own, which fall, once again, these forces generally fall outside of the purview of the command and control of the houses. So the house can't dictate that the, 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 the defiance of self-protection force has to be dispatched to another planet to deal with the problem. They might request it, they might finagle it, they might uh, pull some political chicanery to get this accomplished, but in general, they don't have any say or control over these forces. Uh, we do know that in Tamer Rising and some uh, eras leading up to that, after the, the Jihad, that there's an incarnation of the Defiant Self-Protection Force and uh, the support in the, Duke, the, the Brewers, Duke Brewers of Hesperus, and some of his machinisms and so on and so forth. But that's a grand example. These are still corporate security forces. And they're different from mercenary units because these are solely solely funded, solely supported by the corporation that employs them, that created them. So they are not at liberty to change owners. And they're tied to, you know, if the corporation fails, then so does the defense force. It's just that that important all right then that brings us to let's see if i can get this thing up yeah i am use the same image number eight on my list is private security now there's this, there's this fine line between corporate security forces 
and uh, mercenaries and private security. Private security forces probably traditionally are going to be infantry based with light, light armored vehicles, uh, BTO, BTOLs, perhaps maybe some are, uh, armored vehicles, but it's not unreasonable to find security forces uh, equipped with battle mechs. If there's a there's a there's a need for them or a some business is going to support that kind of uh, money outlet to support uh, to purchase and to operate battle mechs, then then they're going to have them. When we talk about private security forces, uh, this could be once again there are unknown numbers of extremely wealthy families and individuals within the the inner sphere and beyond. These individuals may. It be tandemly uh, considered uh, nobility, or traditionally, I'm, cons I'm thinking that wealthy individuals who are not nobility, you know, some superstar, for example, some uh, second vice president of a major major galactic corporation who's got bucket bucket loads of funds eating holes in his uh, in his in his yard in the back where he's hot, keeping his stash needs to have personal security to maintain the premises of their estates, uh, their private interests, their personal bodyguard force, things like this. This all falls into that category. And to have uh, military units of, of uh, military grade units serving as a security force for private sector is not impossible and probably quite common. So if you've got enough money, if, Bill, if the Bill Gates of the, uh, of, of the uh, corporate uh, or the uh, inner spear uh, has some private island somewhere, perhaps he wants to keep it private. Perhaps it's worth it to him to have a trained, highly equipped, better you know, uh, private security force that's there on a moment's notice because they're, that's their job. They're not going to get tapped to go be somewhere else to go uh, get suckered into or drawn off by bigger interests or by the house because they're outside the purview of the house. Now, generally speaking, collectively, majority of these kind of forces like corporate security, private security, uh, noble guards, for the most part, are not going to be collectively large enough or powerful enough forces to, to stand up against house line units or even reserve or militia units or in some cases, home guard units, because that's, that's not what their purpose is. You might have a single mech pilot and a, a, two squads of infantry with light, light vehicles that are in your employee to guard your private estate. Now, that's obviously not going to be enough of a force to, to take on a determined invading company of mechs, but for most issues that are going to crop up, more than sufficient just is in that line of stuff, right? So when I think of, I'm turn that off. The next one would be number eight on my list is, is, or number nine on my list is what's the local police and or civil defense. Colonial marshals, for example, uh, you're in any given world, of significant size. Even minor worlds are going to have the local sheriff or constables, people whose job is to keep the, to keep the peace, to protect civilians from uh, other civilian problems, uh, protect uh, civilian interests from raiders and from, uh, you know, the criminal elements. And, that, you know, it, it's it's just not unheard of and it, that, that they're going to be equipped. And the best equipped civilian police forces, for example, uh, very large metropolitan areas or planets with large, massive populations, most likely have battle mechs amongst them. One of the most maligned mechs in existence is the urban mech. Lots of people like to, 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 to hate on the urban mech as a mech. And yeah, it has some serious flaws from uh, when you put it in the field and expect it to perform like most mainline battle mechs are supposed to do. But when you, if you utilize it in the area that it was really intended to be ser to, to serve, they're quite effective. So they don't need to be fast. They're mobile. They have jump jets. They don't need to have a huge well uh, of ammunition because they're going to be tied to an easy supply chain, very easy to replenish them in the field. Especially if they're using, if you're using for riot duty or security details or keeping a peace as part of a police force. So having urban mechs 
makes sense. When you have a universe full of people who have access to mechs, your, even your smallest criminal elements and bandit elements have the possibility of fielding one or two or a lance of mechs amongst not including the uh, you know armored vehicles and heavily armored infantry that's prevalent else everywhere else your local police forces would be quite behooven to have that sort of force now as a player as a, as a, as a game master as setting up scenarios for a campaign you know you might find your mercenary command being hired to augment a metropolitan police force because they expect or know a raid is coming or they know that they've been raided sub they've been having problems with a particular criminal element or bandit or what have you or maybe two corporate interests have had decided to have they're done done dickering and uh, they're, they're done with their lawyer their lawyers have done everything they can do the only thing left is actual physical uh conflict between the two entities and it's spilling into the streets the, the, the scenarios are and possibilities are endless but the truth is Every major world with, with populations of tens of millions or hundreds of millions or billions with a B are going to have police forces. They're going to have ranger forces. They're going to have fire departments. They're going to have all these entities, and every one of them are sustainable to support mechs in some form or another. Not to mention that if we take into account that in the civilian sector, in the corporate sector, industrial mechs dominate. For every war mech, every battle mech ever produced, there's probably 50 industrial mechs of some sort or another. And these mechs, while nowhere near as capable as a, as a battle mech designed to do battle, they're quite capable of doing a lot of damage. They can be modified. They can be equipped with mech-grade weapons. That makes them a pretty potent force if they're used to crack open safes at, a local, at, 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 at local banks. And if your police force isn't up to the challenge of confronting these fine, these fine uh, monstrosities, then they're going to be at a gross disadvantage. And it, and you can't always depend on calling up uh, the local military line unit to re, to respond. And sometimes doing so would be uh, detrimental on a number of levels. The so having their own mech force is. Ex quite reasonable and expected in my mind. So take that to the bank and figure out what, how you want to look at it. All right. That brings me to number 10 on my list. And that, of course, this is one eye, Morgraine, Susan Ryan, whatever her name is. Uh, Pirates and bandit lords, bandits. This also would include the criminal elements that I just mentioned, that Yakuza and the mob and the mafias and various other entities across the inner sphere and beyond. That if you have the occasional rogue individual, doesn't quite count. I have a category for them too. The uh, tr truth is, this is a common theme. Banditry and piracy is quite common in and around the inner sphere, both within and out, especially along the periphery. Uh, uh, the, where the larger bandit states and kingdoms thrive. <coughs> Excuse me. So every one of these forces are going to utilize everything they get their hands on. Now, traditionally speaking, you you really start moving a bandit a bandit kingdom starts to become a, or a bandit to outfit starts to become a bandit kingdom when they're able to field large numbers of battle mechs in on a regular basis. So we start talking about uh, Morrison's extractors, for example, where they potentially have two regiments worth of mechs. He can get them overnight. It took him a while to build up that force, and he has to sustain that force. I've done some videos on that. What does it take? What are the what are the essentials? What are the non-essentials? What are the things Things, the logistics of supporting any significant force, uh, uh, militarily speaking, but definitely battle mechs. These are the cutting edge of, of, of battle technology in the in the BattleTech universe, and having access to all the bells and whistles that required to maintain them and keep them operational is expensive, and you can't steal all of it. You just can't steal all of it all the time and make it sustainable. So I've done videos on that, but. The truth is, they're there, and that's another element and uh, segment of the Battletech universe, the Battlemech experience. 
You're not a mercenary or a house line unit if you haven't had at least one engagement with some kind of periphery power or a bandit kingdom, bandit force, pirate, pirate outfit, and or local criminal syndicate issue. So if you have large metro metropolitan areas whose well-equipped police force includes small numbers of urban mechs and or other battle mechs for their utilize, for their use to, at uh, keeping civil control, you, you're going to kind of maybe want to be able to counter them on occasion. So having your own mech or two stashed away is reasonable. Uh, building your own lance, perhaps uh, secretly maintaining it is doable. Then, of course, in a lot of the, re this gets to where we have this wide range of, of, of quality in my mind. Obviously, I have, if you had the New York Police Department somewhere on uh, the equivalent of the New York Police Department on hundreds of worlds across the inner sphere and beyond, the odds are that the NYPD also includes its core mech, mech pilots. Where they might call them something else is another thing, but they would have them. You know, uh, the idea that the local mob uh, has a limited number of machines as well is is acceptable. Well, the odds are pretty good that the the local police force, civilian agency force machines are going to be well maintained. They're going to be well equipped. They may not be cutting edge. They may be old, uh, but they're going to still be in really good shape. Whereas opposed to your yakuza, your bandit forces, it's going to be a mixed lot. You know, they're 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 likely to have the most oldest equipment available that they've stolen or they purchased uh, through fourth and fifth parties. The, it's harder for them to get the parts they need to maintain them. Uh, perhaps the technicians required to do the same thing. Uh, or, once again, we're talking mixed bag. It's not impossible that the local Yakuza or Mafia could actually field top of the line Omni Mix because they've acquired them somehow. They got them through back back channels. They purchased them through corporate hacks and contacts and or bribery and blackmail or outright theft. I mean, the, 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 all the possible scenarios are there. So it's not impossible to find them. Uh, a recent, uh, moderately recent induction into this category was the Colonial Marshal. So between the Magistrate Canopus and the Terran Concordat, they agreed to start uh, co-settling and 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 uh, utilizing the area of the triangle between them and the Laring Com or the the uh, 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 the Compelling Confederation uh, before there became a, a third party grab in politics and stuff in that region. The former House Serrano area fits in that that neck of the woods. So they instigated a program called the Colonial Marines or uh, Colonial uh, Marshals. And they spin into those those uh, local police security constable category that also runs up against the pirate bandit mob connections on a regular basis. These small, much many many smaller unit opera, uh, opportunities for conflict. Once again, mercenaries plug into both sides all the way down the down the rank. This brings me down to number eleven of the twelve on my list. And let's see if I got what I got here. Yeah, I don't think I have an image for that one, do I? Yeah, let's use this one. All right, we'll just jump back to this one. Lone Wolves and Independence. Clear across the history of, of the Inner Sphere and beyond, uh, across all house lines, across military and civilian channels, and all case systems. There are the what I call the Lone Wolves, or the Independents. Some of these are like the bounty hunter, the infamous bounty hunter. They have very narrow goals or or effect. They they don't in the case of the bounty hunter, he, he uh, in a, on occasion he fields a lance. He supports himself with three other mechs, so his mech plus three others, and they take on contracts. Uh, they go after problems and issues, but they're not. You make an argument they're mercenaries, but they're not. They really fall into a different category. It's the same the same category if you go out far enough to the periphery or perhaps some real backwater world in, in the Federated Suns. You know, I know I'm picking on Federated Suns, uh, who's so 
insignificant in the grand scheme of things for the house and politics and they're far enough from the periphery border and far enough from uh, the compelling and, and, and Korea borders to rarely ever warrant having anything more than an infantry battalion stationed there for security. So the occasional independent takes himself up to become the uh, the Robin Hood of the era or the protector of the era. If you go out in the periphery, there's some little colony world somewhere with a few thousand people and one lone dude with his mech. And his mech might be fourth rate, missing half of its armor, a weapon system's not, not working right, or it could be pristine. It's a matter of resources and luck but they're out there. It's the same thing with the bounty hunter. If you think the bounty hunter is the only one in his type the running around, his or her type running around, that would be a fallacy. It would be a mistake to think that. I, I propose that there are literally hundreds of would-be bounty hunters out there. And these bounty hunters would be equipped with mechs because perhaps some of their bounties are also equipped with mechs. And that would make sense. And this is the, the height of the combat, height of battle technology in the inner sphere. The mech is the thing. That's the only, that's the thing, Stan, and that's what Stan wants to have. This also fits the category for gladiators. When we're talking a Solar Seven, for example, uh, a lot of the the little the mech stables and uh, uh, individual independents that that can, that are on Solar Seven. And Solaris is not the only world where this occurs. Uh, it happens out in the periphery, and I imagine to be truthful, it's much more common across the inner sphere than what's proposed or portrayed in the in the lore and in the story. That that it, it it's a it's almost a sport. The the gladiatorial combat in on Solaris is almost a sport. So the, the idea that uh, you might have uh, a roving band of gladiators running around the the, the compelling confederation or or uh, the the uh, Commonwealth entertaining the masses by dueling each other and and brawling on each other in pit arenas or at state farm uh, or state fairs county you know whatever some wealthy dudes back uh, banquet or party thrown for for whatever reason i expect that there's quite a few of these independents or these little independent groups and that's what they do they're not mercenaries they're not in any for any sense of the word they're not uh, going out to fight wars or po for politics or for gain uh, they're doing it for entertainment reasons and getting paid to be entertainers and risking their lives along those those uh, angles then there's also also, unknown numbers of the individuals who, for one reason or another, retired, got out of the service, and took their mech with them. And they went out, they, they set up their little farm to raise their families, and they got the old, the old commando stuck out in the back in the weeds, and the kids learned how to pilot the thing and play on it and run around with it. Perhaps they've, they've got a wasp, but that, that uh, it's got some issues to the point where it just no longer will support X amount of armor or X amount of heat sinks, and it was mustered out at some point or salvaged out and then just acquired and perhaps it's been uh, being quietly utilized as a farm you know on some farm somewhere i imagine this is quite much more common than what we might think they that it would be so there when we talk about the houses fielding thousands and thousands of mechs i propose that there's literally a million or millions with more than one uh, s uh, available across the human sphere of uh, mechs of all calibers and all degrees and all capabilities in all kinds of formations, all kinds of unit uh, designations and support and roles. And they're far more prevalent than what we even give credit for. And that at least brings me down to my last last one and I don't think I have an image for that one. There's a there's an image I had for the for the battle or for the bounty hunter one. I missed that one. Uh, so number twelve on my list is family stables or families. This is not to be confused with the the uh, gladiators uh, glad, gladiatorial stables and stuff found on Solar Seven and other worlds, but especially in the earlier days of BattleTech, uh, it's kind of lost its flavor a little bit in the 50s, the 30, 50s, and 60s, things started to change a little bit, but it's still uh, a, I don't want to say critical part, but it's still a a part of the battle mech experience. That 
it's not unreasonable and, ex and unheard of for a mech pilot. You know, your backstory might be I'm piloting the, 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 the family Jenner. That this is the same Jenner that my grandmother and my great grandmother and her grandmother all all piloted in in the service of blank, and I'm now the the fifth generation to be the fifth pilot or fifth generation uh, of our family, and our family's fortune is tied to this machine. So these machines could very well be members of a line regiment in a house and or a mercenary unit and or a private security forum or a noble guards unit or 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 uh, it's downplayed more now than it was when they first started the game system it was you know which is kind of sad but it's not unheard of the one of the characters that come leaps to mind is a person, a person, a person each called uh, Charles Bear. Charles Bear, as a member of, uh, of the Great Death Legion, one of the founding members of the, the Legion, as a matter of fact, and he came to the uh, Legion when he was, uh, uh, I believe, uh, Grayson uh, went to when he was first forming his regiment or his future regiment. He went to Galatia, and uh, the, the to at that time the uh, uh, mercenary world to find pilots and he didn't have a lot of resources and funds and preferred to find pilots that had their own machines and Charles Bear was piloting a crusader that had been in his family for a number of generations and he had some personal uh, achievements goals that he was trying to set and he has some awesome off or some family obligations as well so his family's fortunes were tied together a, a little bit with that mech so the loss of that mech if he was to become dispossessed would be not only a detrimental to his own personal life and his own personal ambitions but his entire family who depended on the revenue that he was so a portion of what his salary was sent back home and in a lot of aspects if you want to compare that to truck di truck drivers in in america there are quite a few independent truck drivers out there and these independents own and operate their their owner and operators and they own their own vehicles but they work for company corporate interests uh, quite a few of them have contracts with a big a big company so the company pays them more than what they would pay the company drivers because the the the, the owner operator is responsible for the uh, the operational status and repairs and maintenance and expenses and all that goes along with operating a, a truck and in part and so in in return for that he get he or she is gets a better paycheck from their employer because they alleviate the employer's need to worry about things like license and and uh, maintenance and repairs etc cetera, etc cetera. so to find these independent family-owned stables I think is much more prevalent in Battletech than what current lore and current stories suggest I think it's still quite a corner piece of the game world and how these things operation so we have entire generations of pilots who are piling this the family the family wasp or the family marauder and whenever good fortunes allow and you're able to capture especially if you're a mercenary and you're in a mercenary command and you can finagle salvage rights so if you're able to capture a second mech and add that to your family's uh, stable because you've got two cousins that can pilot I mean that's kind of a thing that you're one going to do and, and there are, would be entire families whose fortunes are based on these these stables and uh, they provide their service now this also is a common meme or thread among nobility so a lot of nobles in service to their 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 elite swords their houses uh, bring their own mechs to the field and because it's part and partial it's like the old uh, knights when they had to provide their own armor kind of scenario anyway there's my thoughts on just how many different varieties of mech units and forces that are available out there both for you to to indulge in being a member of or to use as opposing forces or op force the wide range of opportunities available in the battle back universe for this sort of this sort of encounter and play uh you guys got anything I missed? You think of anything uh, that you can add? That'd be great. Anyway, this is Eric. Till next time, you guys have yourself a great weekend.